have butterflies. I really have them. I was amazed to see that I was invited here because you're all looking at me and you're saying, <clears throat> what the hell is he going to talk about today? <laughs> I have a great quality. I have an incredible quality. You know, I can ask questions. Everybody asks questions when they're a kid. They lose them when they get older. Do you ever see a child ask questions? You know, they ask 400 questions a day. An adult of 40 years old asks around two a year. <laughs> he knows it all. You know, you see a kid, he sees a train go by and says, Daddy, Daddy, why does the train have large wheels? Well, you say it's because it wants to go faster. He says, yeah, why is it so slow then? <laughs> He's continuing. But an adult sees a train go by and he says, <laughs> large wheels, they all have large wheels. <laughs> oh, okay. Now, you don't ask any questions anymore. And is it incredible that people work all day long, all their lives, without asking questions? You ever ask somebody why you're just working? You ask them, why do you work? Why do I work? Why do I work? Suck at a face. <laughs> I always worked. I started around 18, 19, going to continue to 65. It's a hell of a long way along to go, but that's it. You don't know why. You never ask the question. You forget asking basic questions. And this is something I'm always doing. I'm asking basic questions. And people don't do it. Even simple things, like I go into offices and I see people writing on four copy forms. And I say, why four copies? Oh, well, it's always I've been four copies. It's a four copy set. <laughs> no, it's built up in four copies. Been here four years. Four copies, that's it. You fill out forms all day. Why do you put that there and that there and so on? Well, it's uh, because of the computer. <laughs> if you don't put it there, it doesn't work. <laughs> the computer brings it back, so you put it there. <laughs> hey, is it incredible? You never asked the question. Why is it made that way? Well, it <laughs> been here 18 years, always been that way. Basically, it's that way. And we forget asking questions. And I think in the next hour, what I'll be doing is asking you questions. The important thing is not my answer. Maybe my answer is wrong. Maybe it is. But the important thing is that you ask yourself the same question. You know, somebody said that questions have a tendency to grow old. And the only way you can have a new answer is to ask back that same question again. We've been doing that in Canada. You probably heard that on the 15th of November, we had elections in the province of Quebec. And one of these days, probably Canada will be thanking Quebec for asking a tremendous question. They asked the question of why. Why? And I think it's knowing why that brings that up. And the funny part is that when an adult asks questions, you ever see the questions an adult asks? They're silly. There's no reasoning behind them. One of my friends one day was sitting in a doctor's waiting room. A large waiting room is a very profitable operation we have with doctors in, in Canada. And he's sitting on a newspaper. And a guy comes along and he says, uh, are you reading it? <laughs> so <laughs> so my, my friend who is uh, always looking for a joke looks at the guy thinking he's joking, but the guy's very serious. He's an adult. So he looks at him and he says, yes, I'm reading it. <laughs> and the guy doesn't even laugh. He takes a, another seat and he says he's reading it. He just told me he's reading it. <laughs> so when my friend sees that the guy's not laughing at all, he stands up, he turns the page and sits back down. <laughs> The incredible part is the guy didn't even laugh. The guy, you say, see, he's reading it, he's turning the pages. <laughs> you know, you're back from a funeral on a Saturday morning. You meet a friend, and your friend tells you, where have you been? Funeral. Funeral? Who? Arthur. Is he dead? <laughs> no, he's not dead. Isn't it incredible? Isn't it incredible? You ask questions like that that have no meaning at all. You have problems with your car on the high road. You're underneath the car. There's always a lot, somebody who stops with a lot of sympathy and asks you, you have a problem? <laughs> oh, it's too sunny outside. I just got in the car. You think I'm doing there? Isn't it incredible? You ask silly questions and you don't ask the basic questions. Let's try to find if there's any basic questions we could ask ourselves. Let's say I'm asking myself, Flum, and you came up with an interesting one that I'd like to 
ask in a few minutes. Please excuse my English. I don't speak very well in English, and I don't speak very well in French. I'm bilingual. <laughs> and that's a problem at home. My mother was Scotch, Gladys Reed, and my father was French-Canadian, Robert Chaput. So actually, up till six years old, I couldn't speak a word of French because I was brought up with my mother, like normally all children are, and I learned English. At six years old, I was placed in a French school. I arrived there. I remember my mother bringing me to school that day with my short pants and saying, goodbye, Johnny. says, goodbye. And then I turn around. I don't understand a word in that school. My first reaction is that when you don't understand, probably they're talking about me, which is not true at all. <laughs> they just say, well, when you learn a little bit of French, you'll be able to play with us. It took me two, three days before I could advance to them and start asking them things, but I couldn't say it in French. So I decided to say it with my expressions, with gestures. And you know we could understand each other. You know that three days later, we were playing cowboy together. They used to go, pow! I, would, I was dying in English and they understood just as well. <laughs> <laughs> so I went through life and I learned French and then I went to the university, or universities in French and then I went to universities in English in the United States. So when I came back, I'm not sure if I speak English or French, so please excuse my English. And on the other side, you'll probably see a couple of sacrifices coming out. They mean nothing, except they mean everything. <laughs> there's that one, and there's tabarnouche. <laughs> That's the other one, and tabarslak. They don't mean anything. They just come out. They replace a whole lot of vac vocabulary, which I'm missing. Okay, that for the remarks, the opening remarks. My first thing is that, if I understand correctly, everybody's looking for one thing, and that's called success. Everybody's looking for that word. We talked about it a minute ago. Everybody's talking about success. You want success for yourself in your career. You want success for your family. You want success for your children. Everybody's looking for success. My first question, what is success? You've asked the same question a minute ago. What is success? What is exactly success? Some people tell me success, Jean-Marc, is uh, when you earn a lot of money, when you have a large bank account, a large car. Well, I say maybe that's a sign of success. But is it really success? Is it really success? If it is, there's a lot of things that are not success. I've met a chap two months ago who's cultivating African violets. He has 400 plants in his cellar. He won third prize in Canada. That's success. You know what the third prize was? A piece of ribbon worth about a cent and a half. That's all. And we're talking about success. Success is not necessarily money. What is success? You have a child in his first years of age, who goes from the stove to the table on his two legs. You look at him and you say, sacrifice. <laughs> he has, he's having success. But if at five years old, he's still between the stove and the table. You say, taba, slack, eh? He should have gained a little bit. He's losing some, eh? <laughs> and that's where success comes in. The definition of success, success is the possibility to surpass yourself, to go further than yesterday. You know, the only animal on earth that can really surpass himself is a human being. Nobody else can do it. Only a human being. And the funny part is the large majority of us forget to surpass ourselves. You know, we're talking about surpassing. We want our children to surpass themselves. Are you surpassing yourself? That's the basic question. No, in fact, people just walk through life. They have a regular life. Isn't it true? What are we looking for? Regular people. Regular employees, never was sick, was always in time on the office, never left before. Worked regularly four nights a week from 22 to 65. He was a regular producer, 180,000 a year. Well, one year he went up to 190. But the following year he, kept, he went down to 170 just to establish an average of 180. <laughs> He's a regular producer. Isn't it true? He even has a regular life. He wakes up every morning around 7 o'clock. 7.15, he has breakfast. One coffee, one piece of toast. Never two coffees, stomach ache. Leaves for the office at 10 minutes to 8. Arrives at the office at 8.30. Yawn. It's going to be a long day today. It's raining out. They won't want anything today. No use calling anybody. Office work. <laughs> Around 4.30, leaves the office, beat the traffic jam. 
always takes the same road. It's always blocked, but it's all, they're always blocked. <laughs> they built it, it was blocked already, so it's always going to be blocked. Arrives home, arrives at the local pub around 6, takes one beer, never two, his wife doesn't want to. Arrives home at 6.30, takes his supper, then opens up the TV. It's lousy on the TV, there's nothing good, but no use changing it, it's always the same damn thing. <laughs> Goes to bed around 11 o'clock. The next day wakes up at 7, 7.15, has breakfast. One toast, one piece of toast, one coffee. Never two, stomach aches. <laughs> always the same routine. Takes his holidays, always the two last weeks of August. It's always raining, but no use changing. Always. <laughs> it's a regular life. <laughs> always goes to the same pension. Has always the same room. The meals are still lousy, but <laughs> no use changing. It's always lousy. It's more the same thing. Always the same. Make a car. He has problems with them, but no use changing. They have problems with other makes. <laughs> he has a regular life. Isn't it incredible? Is that really living? Or living is going a little bit further. Just trying to do something more. Isn't that it? You know, you have a chance to visit a cemetery lately. It's incredible how it's inscribed on tombs and cemeteries. Do you ever see it? You have the date the guy arrived. That's the, gay, the day he arrived on earth, probably in Great Britain. And you have the day he's left. And to sum up, 78 years of life on earth, a dash of an inch and a half. <laughs> Isn't it incredible? And, that, and the dash is not even crooked. It's a straight dash, a regular life. Worse than that, you have other tombs where you have the date the guy arrived. You have the dash, because we know that's what he's going to do. But you don't have the date he's left, but he hasn't left yet. <laughs> so you visit the cemetery, and you're already seeing what you're going to do, a dash. Is that living? Could it be possible to replace this? Wouldn't that be exactly living? And you know that people do that? There's some people who really can replace a dash on the tomb. You know that 2% of people make up what I call parades or processions. They really make things happen. To come back to fun people. They make things happen. They make up a parade. They really move things. You have some in this room. People who go up and they say, why not? Why couldn't I do a little bit further? Why not try something new? They just move it. Okay? Two percent. Two percent. How many millions in England? Fifty-six? How much? Fifty-six million? Two percent of fifty-six million. And you know that 2% is really moving England along? They're really moving the rest of the country along. They're really making things happen. And you're part of that. Now, another group of human beings, 8%, they don't make up parades. They look at parades go by. And they say, sacrifice, that's a nice parade. <laughs> I'd like to be in that parade. <laughs> but I'm too young now. <clears throat> Later. <laughs> when I'm a little bit older, then uh, <clears throat> I'll be able to make up a parade. And when they arrive around 40 or 45... Well, at that point, they're not ready to make up a parade because they have the kids, they have the family, and so on. They say, when the kids have left, and so on, around 55, 60, then I'll make up a parade. And when you arrive at 60, well, it's not going to fight, it's no use making a parade there. You're going to take your pension in five years. <laughs> and at 65, they take their pension. So no use making a parade there. Right? It's finished. And all their lives, they've seen others doing it. Well, they say it's not, it's not the same, it's because he's a natural. He, he, it comes not, he's a born salesman. It's not true. As mentioned a minute ago, all children are salesmen. You're born a salesman. You just lose it when you grow older, when you become an adult. But I never saw a kid who couldn't sell. They all sell. So you lost it. And in fact, you know, sometimes people tell me the difference between the two genre markets. People who make up parades are people that are not afraid. And people look at parades go by. It's because they're afraid. That's why they're always hesitating. You know that the two groups, in fact, are afraid. The only difference between the two is people who look at parades go by are afraid before. These are afraid after. They start the parade and they say, <laughs> Sacra <fai. laughs> We have a story in, in Canada that I usually say it at this point. Which I find very funny. Maybe you won't find it that funny. But it's about the English general who was talking to a French-Canadian general. And he was saying, you see, us Englishmen, we're very logic in everything we do. At war, for example, we always have a red coat, a red jacket, because when we're wounded, the blood doesn't show. So the French-Canadian was listening, and he turns around to Zaid de Can. He says, why don't you bring my brown pants? <laughs> <laughs> that 
as I say, you have to wear your brown pants. It all depends when you want to put them on, before or after. And I think this, but this is only 10% of society. You know that 90% of society doesn't even know there's a parade on. Sacrifice, how the hell can they get in? They don't see it. 90% of human beings don't know that they can surpass themselves. They're on the wrong stop. There's no bus stop there at that corner. But you were to tell them there's no bus stop, and they would say, I don't bother, I don't take the bus. No, no. <laughs> Who wants to take the bus? And that's it. 90% of people don't know there's a parade on, and they could do something. Are you one of them? How can you convince a child to study hard this year if you haven't opened a book for the last six or seven or 20 years? How can you convince people if you haven't done it? I think it starts by there. And it has nothing to do with your profession. It has to do with life. This is basic to life. You can't enthuse people if you're not enthuse yourself. And that's, the, that's what life is all about. My first question, are you in the parade? Are you really making it? Or are you just walking through life? Is this year going to be tremendous? Is next year going to be a fantastic year? Oh, it's going to be... Well, it's going to slow down because uh, the government pension is going in. So if we don't have new products, it's going to be slow. Well, it was slow two years ago. I'm used to it. I've been 20 years in this business. It's normally slow. <laughs> it's an exception. Last year, it's higher, but it's going to fall back down. You'll see it's going to fall. Is that it? That's not making up a parade. How do you want me to buy if you're thinking that way? And that, that's what I mean. Are you in the parade? But there's one basic condition to really be able to surpass yourself. What is the basic condition? You probably know it. You have to enjoy what you're doing. Do you have fun selling? Do you have fun? Do you ever ask that basic question? Do you enjoy what you're doing? You know that 90% of people are working and they don't, don't enjoy at all what they're doing? You know, I've met a life insurance salesman who had been in the life insurance business in Canada for 28 years. And for a half an hour, he told me how lousy business was. It was terrible. <laughs> Policies were down, and he wasn't alone. There were six guys in the branch office, all the same. Everything was down this year. Too many insurance guys. Too many underwriters. They should regulate that and not have so many and so many insurance companies. And like that, I'd be alone and I'd be selling. But sacrifice, there's too many people around here. You know, he had all the reasons. And after half an hour, I told him, do you enjoy life insurance? No. <laughs> no, it's music. I like to play music. I have a little trio, and on the weekend, we play music and cocktail parties, and celebrations, and so on. And I enjoy music. I said, what the hell are you doing in a life insurance company? There's no music there, Chuck. That's for sure. There's no music. What are you doing there? Well, he said, do you ever see somebody earning his living with music? I said, I didn't tell you to earn your living with music, but in music. Why don't you sell something that touches music, that's in the same field? And he decided to sell pianos. It's incredible. In the first nine months, as a piano salesman, he earned more than his best year in life insurance. And it's quite understandable. People go into the store and they say, oh, that's a wonderful piano. He says, that's nothing. You want to hear it? Click -a -click -a -click. He plays piano all day long. <laughs> he has fun. <laughs> He's really having fun. But before that, he used to go and see Klein and you say, you don't want any insurance policy for sure. <laughs> no, it's very low. Business is very low, I understand. It's very tough with inflation. Surely you don't need any. No. Well, I know. We're six guys at the branch office all the same. <laughs> he didn't enjoy it. And I meet people all the way along like that. I meet people in restaurants who don't enjoy serving coffee. You, know, what, you want a cup of coffee? Here's a cup of coffee. The cup of coffee is not good anymore. Hey, it'd be so simple to say, hey, you want a cup of coffee? Hey, I'm, I met a credit manager who took a contract and threw it on the desk and he said, here's another one who won't pay. <laughs> you know, you're lucky they don't pay. If they pay, everyone is paying, you won't have a job anymore. You know, a good credit manager who enjoys credit, he sees a contract who's not paying, he says, ha ha, I'm going to squeeze him. Hey, that's a guy who has fun. <laughs> I once had a Peugeot. Well, you know what a Peugeot is. I held only one, never two. <clears throat> and I remember my Peugeot 504. I used to arrive in a service station, a garage. It sometimes had a little bit of mechanical problems. 
And I would arrive in the garage and the owner of the garage would be standing like that and would say, oh, <laughs> that yours? <laughs> That uh, will never work. <laughs> it's not built for our climate. It's all metric parts. Uh, nobody can understand how this, these cars work. You should have an American built car. And I was looking at the guy and I was wondering, I was saying, sacrifice, that guy doesn't like to service cars. If a guy enjoys servicing a car and he sees a Peugeot arrive, he says, a Peugeot, yes, sir. <laughs> I'm going to repair it for sure. With two Peugeots, you run a garage year long. <laughs> fantastic people. Hey, you're really running a business. But the guy doesn't enjoy Peugeot. I was talking about this chap of, uh, who cultivates African violets. You know, I've been on the road two days with that guy. I was doing calls with him, trying to enthuse him. He's been in the selling business for the last 25 years, a very even producer for 25 years. And the company asked me to go out with him to find out a little bit why he wasn't really clicking. And while we were in between calls, he was always talking about his African violets, how they were sensible, how he lost the first prize in Canada because he introduced a strange plant in the 400 violets he had, and this seemed to arouse a little bit the others, and they all crimped in, and that's why he lost the first <laughs> prize. And oh, it was incredible, you know. I, I didn't know nothing about African violets. But you know what that guy was trying to sell for the last 25 years? He's trying to sell biscuits. <laughs> He's a biscuit salesman. I, I told him, do you like biscuits? He says, no, I never eat sweet stuff. <laughs> this is, how, how are they made, your biscuits? Well, he says, they're very simple biscuits. You know, a biscuit. It's a, it's a biscuit. <laughs> they're not too good, but they're very cheap. Isn't that the basic thing? He doesn't enjoy You know what I told him after two days? I just told him, why don't you sell flowers? And he told me, you think I'd be good at it? Sacrifice. You'd be a genius at flowers. <laughs> You're a genius at flowers. But the guy, no, well, that's a hobby. It's not the same thing. You know that the word work in French comes from, comes from an old Greek word who means instrument of torture? <laughs> Le mot travail. The word travail in French comes from the Greek word that means instrument of torture. And is that true? Do you really sell the fact that you're enjoying your job at home? Look at yourself arriving at home. How do you arrive? 9.30 after a call and Peter comes along and says, Daddy, Daddy, is it Peter? Don't talk so loud. Daddy's very tired. Had a hard day today. He's going to get my slippers and a good beer, cold beer, and <sighs> go and play somewhere else. And Peter goes along and he says, Sacrifice. It's terrible to work in life insurance. See? Daddy's again pooped out. He's finished. <laughs> in the morning, Peter says, I don't want to go to school. He says, what do you mean you don't want to go to school? I'm going to the office. I don't want to go to the office. You're not always doing what you want around here. <laughs> Are you really selling the fact that you're enjoying it? Now, there's basic conditions to doing. Why do people don't always seem to refrain from doing what they, they enjoy, really? Do you have an idea why? It's because they're afraid to pay the price. You know, there's a price to be paid to do what you want to do, to, to do things that you enjoy. There's a price. And the price is not money. The price is effort. Effort. And well, let's put an S. Efforts. You have to put an effort into it. And people are afraid. You know, it's like the singing, the song. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but they don't want to die. So suck it up, ice, you never land there. Yeah? You have to, you, this is the condition. It's the same thing. You have to pay the price. And the effort, people are afraid to pay. I meet people who, who they would like to follow courses, evening courses. <gasps> would they enjoy evening courses? Oh, they're looking forward to evening courses. And I say, are you going to start them this year? Well, no, not this year. Well, <clears throat> you see, in the fall, I have a very large piece of land, and I have to fold my sidewalks and fold my trees up and so on, and this doesn't finish around the 25th of November. And then in the Christmas rush, there's no courses. And in the spring, we're very heavy in work, so there's no time for courses in the spring. And in the summer, it's the holidays, so I'm not going to follow courses during the holidays. So, but I'd like to follow courses. <laughs> I'd like night lectures. Mm, I, I would enjoy it for sure. They'll never arrive there. Why? They're afraid to pay the price. They're afraid to pay the price. The price in learning. Do you learn? Learning. Knowledge. What type of knowledge do you have? Have you been picking up knowledge in the last 20 years? Knowledge, let's say, in 
put an end. Product. You know, I'm surprised to meet salesmen who've been working for 20, 25 years, 30 years in something, and they don't know what it is all about. They, they, well, it's a normal form. Which, uh, <clears throat> this is the form. This is the way it works. Why? Well, uh, for head office, that's a normal question for head office. They're all the same. It's always been that form. This is it. I met a milkman and asked him, how do you homogenize milk? He's been 31 years on the road as a milkman. And I asked him, how do you homogenize milk? Well, this is very simple, very basic. Jean-Marc has a, it's trucks. It's no more cows now, it's trucks. <laughs> and, uh, well, they put a hose and then uh, you see the milk, you see the milk go by and you see the milk and the milk. <clears throat> and then it falls into bottles. It's homogenized. I met a, a young chap last week in Three Rivers. He's learning how to photography in a school. And I, he had a nice flash. And I asked him, what type of flash do you have? He said, an electronic flash. He said, yeah. How does it work? Mm, it's um, electronic. <gasps> an electronic flash, which is electronic, which is quite true, <laughs> basic. <laughs> See, we're, f we're forgetting to learn product-wise. We don't know our products. You know, I once, that's many years ago, around 10 years ago, I was invited to a dinner a luncheon uh, in uh, Montreal, and uh, there was a, an American speaker there, a fantastic guy. And he arrived at the head table with a large stack of Times magazine, put it on the sa side of his dish, and he started eating his roast beef. And when he arrived at the dessert part, he didn't take any dessert or coffee. He just tore up the magazines, and there were a Times magazine of that week. He tore up the Times magazine and gave out the pages to the audience. And then he started off and asking, uh, what page do you have? The guy said, I have page uh, 28. Page 28. Page 28. That's a Volkswagen ad. And he gave out the full text of the Volkswagen ad. He gave the address of Volkswagen in New York with the zip code. And then he says, by the way, in the New England area, there's another address in Boston. He gave the address in Boston with the zip code. He says, what page do you have? He said, page 68. Page 68. That's a Seagram, Seagram ad. And he gave the full ad again with the address. After six or seven ads like that, I was in the back of the room. I told my friend, probably this guy is going to be talking about memory, how you can memorize things quite easily. And he went on for 20 pages. And after 20 pages, he said to the audience, you wonder what I do for a living, eh? I sell advertising in Times Magazine. <laughs> he knew his product. And he says, why? Because now when somebody asks me, do you have any automobile companies in there? So sure, page 28. Here it is. And he can zip it out by heart so I can look at my client. I can see his face. I can see his reactions. You know, in Canada, we have, <laughs> we have quite a lot of immigrants. <clears throat> and especially in the Montreal area for the last couple of years, we had Italian immigrants. <clears throat> and they're really fantastic guys when you look at their tenacity. They're really tenacious. They arrive in, this, in a country, a brand new country, which is Montreal, without a cent. They don't have anything. And two or three days later, they start looking around for a house. And they find a large building, four-story high. And they look at it and they say, sacrifice. <laughs> this is perfect. The whole family will come in here. Because they see them all coming from Italy afterwards, you know, they'll follow. So they, 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 they go up and see the owner, and they don't have any money. And they ask the guy, the owner of the building, how much is a building like that? And the guy comes down and says, well, it's 5000 down payment. $5,000 down payment. $5,000 down payment. Ooh. So he goes back home, and he, they don't have the highest paid job in companies. They're laborers normally. And the only thing they say, well, if we want a, a house like that, we'll have to earn that money and put it aside. And they decide to put $20 a week, which is the maximum they can put aside. $20 a week, $1,000 a year. In five years, they'll be buying that building. And that's exactly what happens. They decide to put $20 every week. On Christmas, they put $20, and, that, and then after that, they buy the Christmas presents. On their holidays, they put $40 in the bank. They're leaving for two weeks. But five years later, they buy the building. And every time I look at them, I say, boy, if us Canadians could be like that, really tough it out like that, because Canadians sometimes decide to put $20 aside, myself. <laughs> you decide to put $20 every week. The first week, you put the $20 in. The second week, sacrifice. <laughs> How can you put $20 in the bank? <laughs> hey, 
hey, you have a golf party or golf entertainment, so you have to, well, you say, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put only 10, and I will put 20 later on, a 30 the next week. The next week, you arrive to put $30 in the bank, and your wife tells you, well, Peter needs a new pair of shoes. You say, sacrifice, how could you put $30 in the bank and buy a new pair of shoes? <laughs> here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put only 10 and put 40 in the following week. <laughs> The following week, you arrive to put 40, you suck it up, no use putting that, it won't work. You can't put $40 in the bank and have money in your pocket the whole week. You won't have a cent. That's terrible. It won't. This system never works, and you take all the money out. <laughs> and five years later, we say, the government should do something. The Italians are buying the whole lot around here. <laughs> and this is the way to do it. You know, sometimes I... And I, I it's fun that there's two ladies here because I want to pay tribute to them, to their tenacity. Because you know that ladies are much more tenacious than men. And you know that's physical. You know that in a baby's room in hospitals, you don't have to wake up a female baby for eating. It automatically wakes up. A male baby, if you don't wake him up, <laughs> he just sleeps. <laughs> It's incredible, eh? You're feeding a female baby and you take out the bottle and he starts crying. A male baby, you take off the bottle, he just turns around, snoozes back off. He says, well, if he doesn't want me to eat, I'll eat tomorrow. That's it. <laughs> Isn't it incredible? You know that only five out of ten of babies resist the uh, incubator, live through an incubator, male babies. Eight out of ten females <coughs> live through an incubator. It's really physical. And look at people, sometimes probably you have this sad experience of relatives or friends who had cancer. Do you ever see a lady to whom we tell her that it's finished, she has cancer? Her first reaction is what? I'm going to tough it out. I'm going to live just the same. I'm really going to go through it. Eh? I had that experience, one of our friends. She really went through it. She's still living after seven years. But you tell a male that he has cancer. This is it. I have cancer. Well, you say, yeah, but you can take pills. It won't work. <laughs> you say, I'm going to take the pills. I'm going to die just the same. And I'm going to die two weeks earlier than the doctor says. And he dies two, two weeks earlier. <laughs> we, really, we really don't have this tenacity built into it. And I think it's basic. You wanted to make up a small test when you arrive home tonight? A fantastic test. Take a blank sheet of paper and try to put five of your qualities without repeating the same one twice. You see, it's tough. I saw people arrive at number three and say, I'm a man. You say, suck it up, I. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a quality. It's standard equipment, right? <laughs> There's nothing there, right? You don't have qualities. But turn the page on the other side and put your faults there, your liabilities, and you'll come out with ten quite easily. And if you're missing any, ask your wife. She'll give you the others. <laughs> Why? Because you register quite easily your faults. You, would you see somebody arriving at lunch in a minute and wanting a glass of beer and say, boys, I'm a genius. The other guys would say, yeah, you're tired a little bit. Take another beer. <laughs> you're afraid to say you're a genius, and you are. Ask your, the guy beside you if he's intelligent, and he'll say, medium, <laughs> average. Is it possible that everybody's average intelligent? No, there must be geniuses around. Why don't people come out and say, I'm a genius? I'm smart. There was a, an, a house a salesman in Montreal who built up a large operation. It disappeared for, since the last two years now, but it was a fantastic operation. He used to sell quite a lot of houses, manufacturers, and so on. And when he had his salesman in front of him, he used to remind them of this, which is a fantastic sentence. He used to say, remember, you're nine feet tall. Remember, you're nine feet tall. So when you meet a guy of six feet tall, you already have three feet over him. But sometimes you're teaching yourself that you, you're only four feet tall. So when you meet a guy of five feet, you say, suck it up, he's eating me up by a foot. So I better be calm. And I think you should remember, you're nine feet tall. You're born a winner. We mentioned it a minute ago. You know, there's a book in the United States that's called Born to Win. Everybody's born a winner. 
The only thing is you forget it because in your memory, you're taking in only your losses instead of taking your victories. You don't know your recipes. Why did you sell that last policy? You don't know. Why is your marriage working well? Do you ever ask somebody who just separated why he separated? Sacrifice. Does he know? <laughs> She's crazy. Tuck attack, dang. He has all the answers. Do you ever ask somebody who's been married 50 years why it's working? I asked my dad. <laughs> I said, Dad, why is it working with mom? You've been married for 50 years now. He said, I don't know. He said, I'm too old to change now. <laughs> <laughs> You don't know why. And I think this is basic. Why are things working? Why is it working? Why is this policy so easy for you to sell? What do you have? And this is what you should be talking about all the time. Your successes, not your failures. A failure doesn't mean you're a failure. Just forget it. Even though you can learn by failures, that's for sure. Surely you learn by failures. But once you've learned the lesson, forget it. And put only victories in your memory. And you'd be fantastic. At that point, everybody will be a winner. And you know you're born to be a winner. You're born to really surpass yourself this year, next year, and the year after. And there's no age limit to that. <laughs> I met a chap a couple of uh, weeks back. He's 96 years old. He's learning Greek. 96 years old, learning Greek. I says, why are you learning Greek? Well, it's, it's, it's today or never. <laughs> <laughs> and, I wonder, and I wonder if you shouldn't say the same thing today. Why don't you start winning today? You're no more a loser. Why should you be a loser? You have everything to win. Everything in your territory, ev everywhere. There's people probably begging. But for that, you have to be convinced that you're a winner first. And that's where we come back to self-confidence. You know, some people ask me, because I had a company once, and they sometimes ask me, Jean-Marc, what is the largest sale you ever made? And you know what it is? It's when I sold Jean-Marc to Jean-Marc. When I sold myself to myself. Are you sold to yourself? Do you feel you're worthwhile? Do you feel you're nine feet tall today? After this conference? Do you feel that tomorrow when you go into the office, sacrifice, it's going to be dangerous around there? <laughs> hey? You'll go into the office and say, excuse me, I'm too tall for the door now. <laughs> Hey, that would be a nine feet tall guy. Why not? Why not? Hey? And once you're winners, you know that winners attract winners and losers attract losers? I'm always amazed to see that in conferences, salesmen conferences, they seem to attract each other. You have a table of losers. You say, suck it up. It's not too good, eh? No, it's not good in my place. No. <laughs> Our business is down. When it's going to be worse next year, isn't it? Well, it's nothing. You want me to talk about how my business is now? <laughs> and they encourage each other. And you have another table where you have the winners. The winners who are talking about, I'm going up to two million, I'm going to have three million next year, and so on. They really see things. And, the, and their clients become winners. I don't want to do business with a loser. I don't want to see somebody who's always traveling about everything. I want to have a salesman comes in and say, sacrifice, isn't this a, a good year, a fantastic year? You know, I was surprised because when I arrived in Manchester, these two gentlemen brought me from the airport to the hotel. And uh, one of the questions I've asked him is, uh, how is inflation? And he told me, very good, only 16%. I was amazed. <laughs> well, he says, what's worse, it was 24. <laughs> he says, you're gaining, you know? And this is only the way it was said. These were winners. But I've asked others, how is inflation? <laughs> Terrible. 16%. It's getting worse. I feel it. It's going to go up. <laughs> it's true. And this is memory. And this is a born winner. And to terminate, maybe I would like to tell you this story about a, an American anthropologist who worked for 14 months in South America studying uh, human relations and these primitive tribes down there. And while he was working for 14 months, he had beside him as a, a maid and so on, charwoman, he had a, an old Indian woman who didn't know how to read or write. She couldn't talk very good English either. But nevertheless, she followed him for 14 months. During 14 months, she was always around him. And she never went to bed before him while he was working with his notes and so on. And during the evening, she would sit in the dark and just look at him. She never got up after him. She was always up before him. She went in all explorations he did and so on. After 14 months of that, 
He was wondering what she was doing there. So he asked her, what were you doing just looking at me like that? And she said this fantastic sentence. She mentioned, I love me best when I'm with you. I love me best when I'm with you. It's not very good English, but it's fantastic nevertheless. With winners, we can say, I love me best when I'm with you. In your families, your children will be able to say, I love me best when I'm with you, Daddy, because you're a winner. Mommy, you're a winner. And maybe if you achieve that, maybe in a country like England, we'll be able to see and feel that people who come here will be able to say, I love me best when I'm with you. Which I can say this morning, I love me best when I'm with you. Thank you.